D&D number four, Weeds Grow in Jesus' Name. Chapter 19. The meeting hadn't even begun when Ricky's cell phone went off. Ricky reached into his pocket. Bree looked up to see Eric and Justin both pulling their phones out at the same time. Suddenly, everyone was moving toward the door. What's going on? Bree asked. Ricky's dead calm face gave her the information she dreaded. Get in the car, he said. What's happening? She asked. Is it Mom and Jeffy? Yes, Bree, Ricky said sharply. Get in the car. They ran out the front door. Bree was barely able to close her car door before Ricky gunned the engine. The gate was already open. Bree glanced back to see Eric and Justin not far behind. He got her, didn't he? She cried. I don't know. Try to stay calm. I have to be able to think. She nodded, taking deep breaths as tears coursed down her cheeks. New scene. Barry sucked in a breath and pulled the gun free. His hand moved to the door handle. He knew he had only one chance, and he'd better make it good. Every move he made right down to blinking his eyes caused pain. He had a feeling his back was broken. He sworn he would protect his charges with his life, and it was time. Go away, Jeffy screamed. You're a bad man. Go away. Tommy stood by her door and laughed. Oh, yes, I am. And you're about to find that out firsthand. Barry pushed his door open. His body fell out onto the side of the road, and he swung the gun around toward Tommy at the same time. There was a sharp, burning pain in his back, and then nothing. Suddenly, he couldn't feel his hands. He tried to pull the trigger, but it was like his mind and body had disconnected. Tommy stepped toward him, took the gun from his hand, turned it on him, and fired. No! Oh, no! Shelley screamed. Tommy tucked the extra gun inside his waistband, returned to the back seat. He grabbed Jeffy by the wrist, jerking hard. Shelley held on to her with every bit of strength she could muster. Let me go! Jeffy screamed. Please, Tommy, please don't take her, please. Tommy put his head into the car and held his gun up to Shelley's head. Let go, or I will pull the trigger. You just saw that I'm not messing around. I don't care if you shoot me. Just please, please don't take Jeffy. Shelly pleaded, tears running down her face. Let go of the kid, Tommy screamed. Shelly shook her head. No, please, she whimpered. Tommy moved the gun to Jeffy's head. I could kill her now or I kill her later. At least if you let it go to later, she has a chance. Now let go. Shelly's grip loosened. Please, Tommy, she whispered, please. Tommy tugged hard and Jeffy flew out of the car. A crowd of onlookers had begun to gather. Some moved toward to offer assistance. Tommy warned them away with the gun as he held Jeffy, struggling and kicking under his arm. Jeffy, Shelly screamed. Jeffy, don't be scared. Daddy will find you. Mommy, Jeffy screamed. Daddy. Tommy quickly climbed into the driver's side of his truck and threw Jeffy into the passenger seat. She immediately tried to open her door but was surprised to find there was no handle. He gunned the engine and they sped away. Jeffy flew at him, attacking him with her fists as he drove. He tossed her away and backhanded her, and she slipped silently to the front floorboard. New scene. There! Bree cried as she pointed at the wrecked car on the side of the road. Oh, no, look at it. How could they survive? Ricky never slowed down. Ricky, they're right there. Stop. What are you doing? Slow down. Are you crazy? What are you doing? I'm going after Jeffy. He has her? How do you know? She was leaning over her seat, looking at the wreckage as they passed. Bree, sit down. But what about Mom? We don't even know if she's alive, and it looked like Barry was thrown from the car. We have to go back. Bree, listen to me. Dad will see to Shelly. Now, I need you to turn around, put your seatbelt on, and be very quiet. Jeffy's life depends on it. She sank down in her seat, the shock setting in. She nodded her head to let him know that she understood. Okay. He drew a breath. Call Jason. 
I'm here, Jason answered quickly. Tell me you have her. I do. They're headed north on Pacific Highway, just passing North Crest Boulevard. That's about five miles ahead of me. Bree sat up in her seat. What do you mean he has her? Ricky glanced at Bree. Jeffy's wearing a tracking device. It's her ankle bracelet. He raised a finger to his lips. Shh. New scene. The car skidded to a halt just behind the wrecked Beamer. Eric jumped out, his heart in his throat. He looked quickly down the highway at Ricky as he sped away. Justin knelt beside Barry, searching for a pulse. Eric glanced at him and Justin shook his head. Shelly, Eric said, his voice soft and calm as always as he climbed into the back seat. Stroking her face, he called her again. Her eyes opened and the tears started. He took my baby, she whispered. We'll get her back. I can't leave you until I know how bad your injuries are. I'm okay, she cried. My feet and legs hurt real bad, but I'm okay. Don't worry about me. Please, Eric, go get my baby. He nodded. I'm going. Justin will take care of you. He started to leave and then turned back. I'll get her back. He took her face in his hands. I love you, sweetheart. He kissed her softly. New scene. The wheels of Tommy's truck threw rocks and gravel as he sped through the deserted concrete plant, passing stall after stall of different colored sand, rocks, and pebbles. Each stall consisted of 15-foot-high walls made of cinder blocks. Each row contained at least 10 stalls, and there were at least 20 rows. Tommy drove toward the far end and came to a screeching halt. Jumping from the cab, he went to the passenger side door and opened the door. Jeffy lay whimpering, still on the floor of the truck. He grabbed her by the back of her shirt and pulled her up. She started swinging at him immediately. You better put me down, you big stupid imbecile. He shook her. Where'd you learn to talk like that? That's no way for a little kid to talk. He approached the wall where he left Beth tied. You're a moron. That's what my brother calls you. A stupid moron. If I talked that way around my elders, they would have beat me to a pulp. I think that's what you need. He set her down on her feet, keeping hold of her hand, drew his free hand back and smacked her backside so hard that her feet flew out in front of her. He jerked her up to stand again and hit her again, and she burst into tears. They rounded the wall, and she spotted Beth, who seemed to be sleeping. Tears streaming down her face, Jeffy jerked free of Tommy's hand and ran to her throwing herself onto Beth's lap. Beth, oh, Beth, what has he done to you? She turned back around. You are a bad man. I hate you. I hate you. My daddy's going to kill you, and if he doesn't, my brother will. I'd be scared if I were you. Shut up, you little brat, or I'll beat you again. It doesn't matter what you do to me. You can hurt my body all you want, but you can't touch my mind. I won't let you. You can't really hurt me. Beth was dehydrated and dizzy, but her eyes were open. Jeffy, shh now. Don't say anything else. We don't want to make him mad. I don't care how mad he gets. I hate him. Ricky's going to kill him. He hurt my mommy and he shot my friend. She stood and went toward Tommy. I hate you. I hate you. You're going to be sorry you messed with me. Will you just shut up? Tommy cried. He grabbed her by the arm. Time to die, baby girl. He pulled his knife, and before Jeffy even realized what was happening, he opened her arm up on the outside from the elbow to her wrist. Jeffy screamed. <laughs> Guess I can hurt you, huh? Tommy said with an evil grin. Tommy, what are you doing? Beth said. Don't hurt her. Please don't hurt her. Suddenly dizzy, Jeffy gave no fight as Tommy jerked her toward Beth and sat her on Beth's lap. Beth's free hand came around Jeffy and held her tight against her. She gasped as Tommy grabbed her hand away from Jeffy and slit her arm almost from elbow to wrist. Only hers was on the inside. He then lined up the cuts pressed their arms together, and began wrapping duct tape around them. When he finished, he stood, backed up, and grinned. Bang, you're dead, he said to Jeffy.
Jeffy only whimpered. Her head fell back against Beth's chest. Beth leaned her head forward, rubbing her cheek against the top of Jeffy's hair. There now, Beth whispered. Everything is going to be all right. I promise. I have a secret to tell you. Everything is going to be all right. Shh. Tommy grabbed Jeffy's free arm and secured it to the wall using the other end of the length of rope that held Beth. Several knots later, he tugged it tight. There. You two aren't going anywhere for a while. It's time for me to go see your brother or father, whoever gets here first. It won't matter who it is, Jeffy said, this time barely forming her words. They're going to kill you. Nah, it won't happen like that because I have this. He held up his gun. And I also have this. He patted the gun inside his waistband that he'd taken from the downed agent. He knelt down in front of them. Well, can't say it's been a pleasure, ladies. I have to go. How about a kiss from my girls? He grabbed Beth's cheeks in one steely fist and kissed her on the mouth. Then he grabbed Jeffy's face the same way. Your first kiss from a real man, he said as he kissed her mouth. Jeffy spit. He laughed. You are definitely Kino's kid sister. New scene. Justin poked his head inside the car. Shelly, the paramedics are on the way. She sniffed. Okay. Are Barry and Cole okay? Cole is on the front floorboard right in front of you. He's unconscious, and I'm afraid to move him. <clears throat> he didn't have his seatbelt on. He was worried about us. He, he turned around to make sure we were secure, she cried. I understand, Shelley. He was doing his job. He wouldn't want it any other way. Have you heard from Eric? Not yet, Shelley. He's only been gone about two minutes now. He looked down the street to see police cars charging down the hill. The police are here. I'm sure the FBI isn't far behind. She grimaced in pain. A and the paramedics? Any minute now. I can't move my legs. You're pinned in pretty good, and Cole's body is keeping the seat from being moved. They'll probably have to work on him first. That's fine. I'll be okay. What about Barry? You didn't ever tell me about Barry. Justin sighed. He's dead, isn't he? Shelley said, her eyes filling again. Tommy shot him. Yes, Shelley, he's dead. An officer arrived and Justin turned to fill him in on what happened and told him to expect the FBI any moment. Even as he said the words, a couple of sedans pulled up and immediately took over the scene, dispatching the local police to handle the traffic issues that had suddenly become major. Witnesses to the entire thing remained faithfully to tell their version of events. All of them had been deeply affected by the sight of Tommy ripping a child from her mother's arms and carrying her away, kicking and screaming. Shelley leaned her head back and visualized Eric finding Jeffy alive and well and bringing her home. Please, Eric, find my baby. Please, God, in Jesus' name, please give him your power and your strength. New scene. Okay, Rick, coming up, look for Reef Point Drive on the right. Help me look, Bree. She nodded her head, started reading off names of streets as they passed. They've gone off-road, Jason reported. They're in the middle of a large, uncharted area. He was silent a moment. They're stationary. If he stays put, we've got him. Bree drew an excited breath. Jason waited a bit before he spoke again. He had Eric on the cell listening so he could find Ricky easily. Okay, Rick, I show you're getting close. I just passed Irvine Coast Drive, Rick said calmly. He'd been doing well over 100 and was having to slow down to read signs. Another mile. You should see it. Bree pointed in front of her. There. There's a street. That has to be it. Ricky slowed and turned right. Okay, Jason, I'm on Reef, I'm on reef Point. Past two streets, turn left on Gondolier's Bluff. That's one, Bree pointed as she strained to see ahead. And two, take the next one, Ricky. There. I got it, Ricky said. Go, Jason. Left again on Whaler's Drive at the end of the road. Ricky gunned it to the end. We're in a deserted quarry, maybe, he said, to give Jason more information. There's no one around. All sand and rocks. He came to the end of the road. Okay, I'm left on Whaler's. Pass one road, then take the next right on Cliff House Bluff. Now it's about to get difficult. Listen carefully. At the end of Cliff House is a vast area, I'm going to guess, of sand and rocks, as you described it. This is an old quarry. 
he drives straight off the end of the street and goes 170 yards, then veers to the right. Okay, Ricky said, so a little less than two football fields. Bree, lean out your window and look for tire tracks. They drove slowly, trying to judge the distance and look for tracks. Ricky sighed. The wind blew too hard here to leave tracks in the dry sand. He'd have to just judge it. I think I've gone far enough, Jason. You have. Veer right and stay on course 50 yards. Holy, Ricky said as they came over the hill. Fill me in, please, Jason said. There's rows and rows of concrete walls. They're like holding bins for sand and rock. A concrete plant, Jason said. Has to be. From my screen, you should be right in front of Jeffy. Do you see his truck? It could be on the next row or the next or the next, Ricky answered. He cursed. Sorry. Don't get discouraged. Jeffy is definitely in one of those stalls. Hold on. He was silent a moment. Your dad says don't go straight in. He says to get centered and use your skills. Rick, if he hears your car coming through there, he might do the deed. Bree's tears started again. I'm stopping. I can move silently on foot. Get my dad here. Working on it, Rick. Be careful. He has a gun. He shot Barry. FBI have dispatched a couple of choppers. I'd like you to get to Jeffy before they show up. Got it. Ricky turned to Bree. Stay in the car. He shot Barry, Bree said. I have to go. Wait for Dad. She nodded. She watched as he ran toward the line of walls and silently disappeared around the corner. It took her only one minute before she was out of the car. She paced, straining to listen to what may be happening. Then she stopped. She could have sworn she heard something. Standing completely still, she listened. Voices, maybe? She moved slowly toward them. She began counting stalls as she moved down the first row along the opposite side Ricky had gone. When she got to the end, she turned left and moved around the far side of the area. And when she came to the second row, she stopped. Was it the wind, or did she hear a tiny voice? She didn't dare call out. She turned and eased her way up the second row from the back. Shh, it's going to be okay. Bree turned sharply and gasped as she took in the scene. It was Beth she'd heard whispering. Beth sat on the ground, her back leaning against a concrete wall. Jeffy was in her lap, her head fallen over sideways, as if she were sleeping. Their right hands were tied by a thick rope to a hook in the concrete wall. Their left arms were taped together. Jeffy was pale. Beth was worse. Beth was speaking soft words of comfort to Jeffy. Bree knelt quietly down in front of them, and Beth looked up at her, her eyes unfocused, and Bree touched her face. I'm going to get you out of here. Jeffy woke, and Bree quickly put her hand over her mouth and placed a finger to her own lips. Hey, baby, Bree said softly. Bree, Jeffy whispered, he hurt Mommy and Barry, and he spanked me. Okay, Munchkin, you can tell me all about it later. Right now, let's get you out of here. Bree rose and eyed the knots in the rope. It was thick and tied very tight. Her hands shook as she tried to loosen the knots. After several minutes, she realized she wasn't going to be able to do it. Tears welled in her eyes as she came to the conclusion that she would have to leave the girls and go for help. What's taking so long? Jeffy asked in an exaggerated whisper. Bree knelt down in front of her, a tear running over her cheek. I can't untie it. There's too many knots and the rope is too thick and I can't budge it. Jeffy nodded. It's okay, Bree. Don't cry. I know you tried. Bree sniffed. I have to go find something. Maybe Ricky has a knife in his car. Ricky's car? Ricky's here? Yes. How do you think I got here? Jeffy shrugged. I don't always think of everything. Daddy says that's okay. Where is Ricky? He's looking for Tommy. I was supposed to stay in the car, but I just couldn't. I had to look for you. Bree, Beth said weakly. Tommy has guns. He's waiting somewhere behind a wall to shoot Ricky. Bree bit her trembling lip. Ricky can take care of himself, she answered, though she was pretty sure she didn't sound very confident. That's right, Jeffy said proudly. Shh, Bree reminded her sister. I have to go get something to cut the rope or at least pry it apart. I'll be right back. Thank you, Bree, Jeff murmured. Be careful. Bree hugged both girls. We'll have you free in no time.
She rose and ran quickly back toward Ricky's car. Eric's car came over the rise just as she got there. He pulled up beside her and jumped out of the car. Oh, Eric, thank goodness you're here. I found Jeffy, she said, her voice filled with panic. I can't get the ropes untied. I tried, but I can't. You have to come. Okay, he said softly, his heart soaring that he'd soon see his daughter. Let's stay calm. He reached into his car and pulled a knife out of the glove compartment. It was one Bree recognized, Ricky's old knife, the one he'd once given to her, the one used to kill James. He quickly took off his shoes and socks. Take me to Jeffy. As they started back toward the rear, a shot rang out. Bree gasped. Ricky! She turned and headed toward the sound, but Eric grabbed her. He looked into her eyes. You have to trust him. Take me to Jeffy. She ran toward the rear with Eric at her heels. Daddy, Jeffy cried. Eric made a cutting motion across his throat and Jeffy silenced immediately. Quickly, he cut them free from the wall, then began to cut through the tape and the space between the two arms. As he pulled the tape away, he realized what had been done. He gathered his daughter in his arms, breathing a sigh of gratitude that he'd found her alive. For now, anyway... What has he done? Bree asked in hushed tones as she saw the girl's lacerated arms. He cut me, and he cut Beth, and he put her arms together because he thinks that will make me sick with AIDS, but it won't. He thinks Beth has AIDS, but she doesn't really, Jeffy whispered. You don't? Bree asked. Beth shook her head. I told that to everyone when I left home so that men would leave me alone. She shrugged. It didn't work all the time. I'm sorry I worried you about Mark and everything. I was obviously on the wrong side. I was so blind. No time to talk about that now, Eric said. He picked up Jeffy and handed her to Bree and then lifted Beth into his own arms. Be careful, Daddy, Jeff whispered. She's real sick. I will, baby. Come on, let's go. Eric and Bree carried the girls back and placed them in the back seat of Eric's car. Eric knelt beside Jeffy and touched the giant purple bruise on her face. Tommy did this? Yes. And he spanked me, too. Eric's face darkened. And he kissed me, too, and I spit it out of my mouth. Eric's eyes closed briefly. I have to go help Ricky. Do not get out of this car. Tell me you understand. I understand, Daddy. Eric nodded at Bree. Call Shelly and Jason and tell them we have Jeffy. Bree nodded, and Eric took off. Bree watched as he ran up where some rocks were in one of the stalls and scaled the wall with ease. He laid flat across the top of the wall, then stood and ran full speed down along the top of the narrow structure. She sighed. Ricky was in good hands. Bree spoke with Jason first and then her mom. She reached through the back window and handed the phone to Jeffy. As they spoke, Bree turned and listened, but she heard nothing. Apparently, the men were playing hide-and-seek. Then... Another gunshot. Her heart raced, and she knew she had to help. There is no way she could stay here, all safe and cozy, while the man she loves is being shot at. She leaned her head in. I'll be back. And she took off. As she rounded to the side where she'd originally seen Ricky go, she heard helicopters in the distance, and she looked up to see Eric on top of a wall, giving signals to someone whom she could only presume was Ricky. He held up a finger and then pointed east, and though she knew the signal wasn't meant for her, she moved that direction. She knew the moment Ricky finally made contact with Tommy. His key eye was powerful. There was cursing and the sound of flesh hitting flesh. Then all sound was drowned out as the choppers approached. She came around the next wall to see Ricky holding Tommy's hand, the gun waving madly in the air as he kneed Tommy in the groin. Once, twice, Tommy grunted in pain. Ricky pushed him back and slammed his hand against the wall. and The gun went off, but Tommy still held on to it. Ricky turned and threw Tommy over his shoulder, still holding the gun hand. The gun went off again, just as Tommy's wrist snapped. Ricky took the gun from his hand then and tossed it away. And Tommy rolled on the ground in pain. Get up, Ricky ordered. Tommy got to his knees. His left hand moved in toward his waist. Pulling Barry's gun, he pointed it at Ricky. With blinding speed, Ricky moved forward and snap-kicked Tommy's left hand. The gun went off, barely missing Ricky, and flew into the air. Ricky spun and his foot bashed into Tommy's face. Blood spurted from his nose. 
He spun again and hit the side of Tommy's head, and Tommy staggered. Moving in, Ricky kicked toward Tommy's knee. The kneecap shattered. Tommy screamed and fell to the ground. Ricky straddled him and swung at Tommy's face until it was nothing but a piece of red meat. Eric jumped down off the wall and hurried toward Ricky. Enough, Rick, he said softly. But Ricky didn't stop. Eric had the urge to let Ricky finish him, but that would only hurt Ricky. He was suddenly aware that the place was swarming with FBI agents, and Eric reached down and banded Ricky's arms in a steel-like grip. It took all he had, along with two FBI agents, to tear him away from the fallen man. It was several moments before Ricky stopped struggling. Slowly, he turned and looked into his father's face. Eric's expression was one of love and compassion. Better? He asked softly. Ricky breathed and nodded. Jeffy? She's safe. Bree found her. Shelly? She's alive. I don't know the extent of her injuries, but I'm about to find out. Ricky turned to go find Bree, but noticed several agents bent over somewhere on the ground. Ricky and Eric both hurried forward. The circle of agents parted. Bree lay on the ground, her face pale, her eyes closed, her upper right chest soaked with blood. One of the agents held his shirt against the wound. Ricky dropped to his knees beside her. I got it, he said as he took over, applying pressure to the wound. The words of the men around him made their way into his brain. Stray bullet, one of the agents said. Lost a lot of blood. Mr. Hart. Maybe not life-threatening if we can staunch the bleeding. Ricky leaned close, his eyes moistening. Bree, baby, don't you leave me. She opened her eyes and smiled. I won't, she said weakly. She grimaced. Wow, it really hurts to get shot. He brushed his free hand over her hair. I bet. It would probably help if you don't talk. He took her hand. They'll get some morphine into you, and you'll feel much better. Eric leaned over Ricky's head to peer down at Bree. They tell me the paramedics will be here any minute now. Are you going to yell at me for not staying in the car? Soon enough, she sighed. I thought I could help. I've heard that one before, Ricky cupped her face. We're going to have a long talk about this. Let me guess. You're thinking... Maybe you should turn me over your knee. He smiled. Well, that's very close to what I had in mind. And that is the end of chapter 19.